Every bar book in games, it's week 12 action in the NFL, especially Sunday night football. And you can catch all the great game action right here in Atlantic City at Ocean Casino Resort, home to the gallery, bar, book, and games. And what brings you the Jacob Media pregame show each and every week. Hello, I'm Mark Farzett, along with Derek Gunn, Eagles veteran reporter, as well as Eagles Hall of Famer, Mr. Seth Joyner. Eagles had some kinks to work out over the last couple of weeks, taking a loss to the Washington Commanders, their only one so far this season, and then a very close game all the way down to the wire last week against the Indianapolis Colts. So we'll start things off before we get into Aaron Rodgers and his thumb injury. We'll start things off with the Philadelphia Eagles, of course, and where we stand right now after those two struggleful games, if you will, against the Commanders and the Colts. One, they pulled out the victory. The other, they did not. Seth, are you confident at least, before we get to predictions at the end of the show, are you confident at least that those types of struggles are behind the Eagles? Well, listen, you never know because – that's the thing about this game. You know, it's an imperfect game. And the beauty of it is that, you know, even though, you know, they haven't played up to their standard, they haven't played up to the standard that we've come to expect. If you look at the record, you know, over the last two weeks, they're one and one. Look at the overall record. They're still nine and one, and they're in control of their own destiny. They're in control of the, the NFC conference as far as the playoffs are concerned. All they got to do is just hold serve, keep winning, win the games that they're supposed to win, and um, everything else to take care of itself. Now, we get analytical about it because that's what we do. I mean, that's what we're paid to do is to break all of this down and, you know, not only give props to when they do things well, but also to analyze and critique what they do wrong. Um, the thing that we all fear the most, they seem to have got it worked out. We'll see how the big guys recover from one week to the next and what they bring us tonight. Um, but it is going to be a monumental task before them, even though – the, the Packers are sitting at four and seven. You can never discount this team, not with A.A. Ron, you know, at playing playing quarterback. Man. No, uh, of course not. Absolutely not. But one of the things, and as Nick Sirianni referred to it in his most recent press conference, uncharacteristic, uncharacteristic fumbles right. by the Philadelphia Eagles. One was a tough hit from Jalen Hurts taking that big hit where he asked Miles Sanders to uh, block uh, Yannick Ngakwe. Not really a great strategy. Uh, and then also yet another one by A.J. Brown. Gunner, can we be confident going into tonight that those struggles are behind the Eagles. No, you got to see the game played out. Great. I mean, you know, we looked at how the Eagles have dominated in the turnover game for the most of the season, the last two games. They've lost the turnover battle. That is the law of averages in the National Football League. Now, when you look at how many turnovers Green Bay has compared to the Eagles, I will ask you a question, yes. I feel good about the Eagles winning the turnover battle when you look at this particular matchup. But then again, when you look at how some of the games have played themselves out across the National Football League today, again, you have to expect the unexpected. One thing we know, and it keeps, it keeps ringing in my ears when I ask Lane Johnson, what are defenses doing differently? He says they're showing you things that we're not seeing on film, which has helped stagnate their offense in a lot of ways. We talk about this explosive offense they have. Well, you know what, happened? Seth, I don't have to tell you this. When you're going to play an explosive offense and you have a lot of film on them, what are you going to do? You're going to flip the script a little bit and try to give them something they, don't ha they haven't seen before. And that's exactly what Washington and, and Indianapolis have done to them. Now, how do they counter that? They didn't counter it well enough against Washington. They countered it in the nick of time against Indianapolis. Who knows what they're going to see tonight? Quite literally in the nick of time, as in 11 p.m. the night before when you had a guy like <laughs> Indomitian Sioux, excuse go. me, Thursday, Thursday night going into that game against the Colts. And if there's any way that Howie Roseman could achieve to be the executive of the year, which I know no one's really rooting for in Philadelphia, but it is a thing. You get two guys like Linval Joseph and Ndamukong Sue in the middle of your defensive line after a whole slew of injuries take over your defensive line. They're helping out Fletcher Cox. They're helping out Javon Hargrave. I believe this game right here, gentlemen, is the game you went out and got those two guys to be in the middle of your line of scrimmage. This is the game because you have a guy like Aaron Rodgers, Seth, as you pointed out, can still take over a game even with one thumb, even though surgery might be coming upon him as early as next week. You get a game like this. You get those two guys for a game like this where there's a great run game and a great pass threat as well in the Green Bay Packers. See, I beg to differ. Okay. I think that that move was made solely for what's coming next week. Next week. But they don't have the passing attack. It that doesn't a team matter, like that. though. Okay. It doesn't matter, though, because okay. what you saw against the Texans and what you saw against Indianapolis was a situation where, you know, you couldn't get the run game, you know, under control. Well, I should say um, um, the Texans – 
and the Washington Commanders. You couldn't get the run game under control. Um, and if you can't get the run game under control, then you can't get off the field on third down. That was the big deal with them against the Commanders, uh, along with the turnovers. Mm. Um, are they going to help tonight? Listen, no doubt about it. Because the blueprint up until those guys arrived last week was to run the ball at this defense, you know, especially when you get them in their four-man front because they hadn't figured it out. Um, dominate the line of scrimmage. And because you're dominating the line of scrimmage, now play action pass comes alive. See, it doesn't make any sense to play action if you don't set it up with the run first. But they've got two great running backs in A.J. Dillon and, and Aaron Jones. And I think Aaron Jones is one of the most dynamic running backs in the NFL. And I don't think that Green Bay uses him enough. And we saw a couple of games back where they basically took the ball out of Aaron Rodgers' hands and, and won a game against Dallas by running the ball right at him. Don't think that they're not going to come out and test, you know, these 13-year vets that are sitting in the middle of this defense tonight. They're going to test them to, to see, A, can they recover from, you know, the snaps that they took last week? You know, is it fool's goal? Can the Eagles really stop the run? And if they can't, then that makes life so much easier for Aaron Rodgers throwing the ball. Listen, he struggled all year long. He's got a slew of young wide receivers that are trying to figure it out. Um, th this dangerous kid named, you know, Christian Watson, loved him coming out, you know, in the draft last year. He runs 4-3. He's like, you know, 6'4", you know, 220, 220 pounds. And all of a sudden, he's woken up the last two weeks. He scored five touchdowns over the last two weeks. Now, Romeo Dubes is a guy that they've lost. And, you know, they're, they're not going to have him tonight. But Watson has certainly stepped up tonight. So if you can't get the run game under control, then you put yourself in a precarious position of, okay, Aaron Rodgers is going play action pass. He's moving all over the place. He's got guys streaking all over the field. You know, he knows how to get – he knows how to attack a zone. So he's going to do that as well. We like to play a lot of zone, a lot of quarters coverage. He's going to look up and see the corners 10 yards off the ball. He's going to take that five yards every single time. But if you can make them one-dimensional early, if you can figure out a way to get that run game under control and make them one-dimensional earlier, I think it makes it a lot easier to play against the pass. We talk about the uh, addition of the Eagles' big men in the middle, and rightfully so. But when you watch this Green Bay running attack, they like to get out on the perimeter a lot. You know, you look at Indianapolis, and they like to run between the tackles. They're going to send Aaron, uh, Aaron Jones out on the perimeter a lot. I think the outside linebackers and the, and the corners and the safeties are going to have a productive night tonight. I expect one of them to be your leading tacklers. I don't think Green Bay is going to attack the interior as much. Now, when A.J. Dillon is in there, yes. But they're either going to get Aaron Jones out on the perimeter in the running game or dump passes off to him. Aaron, Aaron Jones has 41 catches for Green Bay. And, and when you when – you, you want to know why? Because they haven't had much else in a receiving game. And as Seth said, it's taken most of this season for the young guys to emerge. But Aaron Jones is still such a primary weapon and a dynamic weapon out in open space. You have to utilize that young man to the fullest. This is a, Eagle, a, a, a Packers team that is right now in dire straits. The season is basically over. A lot of guys are playing for tomorrow. And when I say tomorrow, I mean next season. So they're going to come out tonight. They don't want to be embarrassed on national TV. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Now, I look at that interior defensive line you just mentioned. Definitely going to be something that the Packers are trying to avoid going into tonight's game. But, Seth, as you mentioned, and we've seen it so many times throughout, really Jonathan Gannon's career here in Philadelphia as the defensive coordinator are the guys playing 10 yards off the line of scrimmage, 10 yards off the wide receivers. You can expect a lot of that same play from a guy like Darius Slay tonight. You can expect a lot of that same play from James Bradbury tonight. And although they're great when it comes to turnover differential, when it comes to being aggressive, that word has become the buzzword surrounding Jonathan Gannon. Whether or not he will be aggressive in a game tonight or he's just going to allow his defensive line to try to go out there and eat, stop the run, and also let his defensive backs stop Aaron Aaron Rodgers. So going into this game tonight, looking at Aaron Rodgers and the thumb injury, I find it wildly convenient that it's coming out now at this point in the season that they're one in six. And it's also he first reported it when he talked about how he suffered it in the Giants game in week five. How much of this season is Aaron Rodgers with a bum thumb? And how much of this season is Aaron Rodgers not having as productive a year simply not because he has uh, simply not having Devontae Adams anymore? Listen, I think it's a combination of the two. I think it's a combination of the young guys not coming along. I think it's a combination of him, you know, not wanting to cede any time to Jordan Love to get on the field, even though he's going to be the guy. Um, you know, 
I, I just feel like they thought that this was going to be their year. I mean, they spent seven draft picks on the defensive side of the ball, and they're decimated over there. And Aaron Rodgers has, has said, you know, before the season, hey, the, the defense may have to carry us for a while until we kind of find ourselves. Um, so I think it's a combination of all of those things. I, I think it's a combination, you know, of their offensive line. You know, David Bakhtiari, who's supposed to be, you know, their, their, their foundation of their offensive line, he just has not been able to get 100% healthy. He's in for a couple of plays, he's out. He's in for a game, he's out. And when you don't have that kind of stability, then that, that takes away from the protection of the quarterback, especially when you want to be a 60-40, you know, pass-to-run team. And that is what they are. I mean, it, it, when you look at the numbers, you know, they're, they're averaging 120, 122 yards per game running the ball, which, which ranks 14th. You would think that with those types of numbers that you would run it a little bit more. But no, they throw the ball, you know, 60% of the time. And they're ranked 19th against the, you know, they ranked 19th in passing this year with 222 yards per game. Now, those numbers are paltry, you know, when you talk about Aaron Rodgers. So when you ask the question, what is it a combination of? It's a combination of it all. The young wide receivers, the thumb, and the injuries, and the instability on the offensive line. We, we have mentioned it, start of the show. You could never just bet against a team that has Aaron Rodgers as their quarterback. He's still a four-time MVP. He's still back-to-back -back MVP last season, the year before that as well. But this year, and Gunnar, you alluded to the turnovers earlier. When you look at just the turnover factor, he's got seven interceptions that he's thrown so far this season. He's had nine in the previous two years combined. He has not had a seven-pick individual season until tw uh, all the way back to 2016. So the turnovers have been a big issue for him this year. Do you attribute that to a lack of targets, or do you attribute or weapons, I should say, or do you attribute that to the thumb? All of the above. Um, you could tell when you watch them play earlier in the year, they're not on the same page between quarterback and wide receiver. The last time Aaron Rodgers had double digits interceptions go all the way back to 2010. That tells you how well he takes care of the football. The thing that's scary is, now this thumb has been bothering him supposedly since the first several weeks of the season. It didn't seem to bother him when he came out and torched Dallas a few <laughs> weeks ago. And then all of a sudden last week he couldn't hit the ocean. Wide receivers running across the middle of the field wide open and he missed him by a mile. So that's the scary part. Which Aaron Rodgers is going to show up tonight? You know, the word out of Green Bay in the state of Wisconsin is it looks like Aaron Rodgers is, is quit on the Green Bay Packers. You know what? As long as that man's under center, especially in a primetime game, and you look at his history in primetime games, I don't think there's quitting Aaron Rodgers. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. It seems like, though, everything he's been saying on the Pat McAfee show has been quite to the contrary, where it seems like, well, you know what? If guys aren't performing, guys got to lose reps. And Aaron Rodgers, of course, left a lot to be desired so far this year. Now you added the injury, plus a guy they drafted in the first round right behind him, waiting to get in there to play some uh, football as well. It could be the end, this season, for Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers and possibly going forward. Now, let's focus on the Eagles and what they have coming into this game tonight. First off, you have a guy in Jalen Hurts who I think, without question, I know you guys talked about this on the post-game show with Mike Misnelli and also with Devin Caney after beating the Indianapolis Colts last week, but that was an MVP fourth quarter by Jalen Hurts. All went wrong for the Eagles in the first three quarters of that game when it came to the offensive side of things. Seth, of course, defensively, things were going just right for the Philadelphia Eagles in that game, but offensively, they had a lot left to be desired. Jalen Hurts stepped up with that touchdown pass to Quez Watkins, then he ran one in for the game-winning score, what ended up being the game-winning score, and that is how a lot of people really started to add to the conversation of Jalen Hurts being an MVP, at the very least, in the MVP conversation. What more does he need, other than finish out the season very strong and go through the second half of the year and all that, what more do you think you need to see, and what more do you think undecided voters need to see from Jalen Hurts for the rest of the season? Well, listen, I, I won't dispute any of that, but let's go back and let's look, let's go back and, and dissect that last that last drive okay it was 11 plays 75 yards ended with the with the draw they started off with three passes in a row okay they got lucky because they get the 39 yard pass interference and then they turn around and they run the ball eight consecutive times in a row okay so now what does that tell you they knew that their bread was buttered running the ball Okay, Jalen Hurts had the fourth down conversion on fourth and two. Then he comes back, you know, with the seven-yard quarterback draw. But in between there, you've got Miles Sanders ripping off five runs. You got Kenneth Gainwell that had 
you know, one run. So my question to you is, why aren't we running the ball earlier? Why has Miles Sanders continuously disappeared from this offense, you know, at times where he could be of great benefit? You know, and tonight's one of those nights, you know, dare I say, the Packers, let me see, what do they rank? The Pack, Packers' defense is ranked um, 24th against the run. 25th against the run. They're giving up 135 yards per game. Okay, so now, shouldn't we be trying to make hay running the football against this football team, shorten the game, minimize the amount of possessions and opportunities you give a guy like Aaron Rodgers to find his groove tonight? That's what we should be doing. But common sense will always tell you that they're going to do ex exactly the opposite because maybe that's what they anticipate, you know, the Packers anticipating that they may do. No, go out. We got the best offensive line in football, okay? And, yeah, we're missing our tight end. It's a major part of what we do in the run game. But we can run the ball straight at the Green Bay Packers and create those – those wins on first and second down. So if we get to third down, we're always in third down, third and manageable situations where we can convert it. So, um, you know, to, to me, that's the rub of, of how this game is going to go tonight from an offensive perspective. Uh, well, I'm looking at, I think Gunner's looking at the same thing. You have a guy who's having a career year this season in Miles Sanders and what he's been able to bring to the table in running the football and doing it consistently when you give him the football. But it seems like it's few and far between. And we've gone through other instances as well where they're only giving him the football right. twice in the first half. And, and let me say this because you did ask me about Jalen Hurts, not so much about the running game <laughs> yes. and Miles Sanders. I will say this. Um, Jalen Hurts last week did what was necessary to get this team the W because I felt like the coaching staff tried everything that it could. Everything that they had, they threw it at Indianapolis. And I think the familiarity between, you know, staffs, kind of was a tell and the fact that you know you've got all of this all of this film that now you're able to break down and start to take away some of the things that the Eagles do well that means that the coaching staff is going to have to go back to the drawing board and figure out ways to key break what they do but I think Jalen proved that hey when push comes to shove if I really need to hoist this team on my shoulders I can get it done and I can get it done throwing the ball. And, and, and if teams want to come at me or if teams want to play man-to-man -man behind, you know, man-to-man -man coverage and nobody's open, I can make it happen with my legs too. So that's something that you're happy to see. You know, and, and listen, the last two weeks, I'm not overly disappointed by how they play on either side of the ball because, you know what, this team needed to face some adversity. They needed some of these things to happen. They didn't need to just breeze through the season and everything be hunky-dory, and then they get to the playoffs and the pressure of the playoffs, you know, grab them. Now, they've gone through some things, and they've experienced some hardships, if you want to call them hardships, you know, that will make them a better team, a tougher team down the road, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about Tua in terms of MVP. You're talking about Patrick Mahomes in terms of MVP. And then you're also talking right there about Jalen Hurts as well, Gunner. I think Patrick Mahomes right now is a clear-cut favorite to win the MVP. You know, you watch what he did last week against the Chargers. You watch what he's done all season long. He is that guy. And let's favor him. When you talk about a lot of voting and stuff like this, there's a lot of popularity involved as well. And right now he is at the pinnacle of his profession. Patrick Mahomes, I think, is the clear-cut front runner right now. He has, what, 28 touchdown passes going into this game today compared to 15 for Jalen Hurts, although Jalen Hurts has, is uh, responsible for 23 touchdowns. But – it's a popularity thing as well. And I think right now, a few weeks ago, we were talking about how close this race was. I think as we sit here right now, Patrick Mahomes has separated himself from the pack. Uh, it certainly seems like it. But you know what? If you want to see this, this game and maybe this MVP in action live at Lincoln Financial Field, here's a little note from one of our main sponsors, of course, Pond La Hockey, on how you could win tickets to the next home game. Hey, Philly. It's Tom Giordano from Pond La Hockey Giordano. Be sure to follow Pond Lee Hockey on Instagram for your opportunity to win free Eagles home game tickets for the rest of the season. You heard that right. We're giving away free tickets all season long. And guess what? We're going to give away tickets to the playoffs and the Super Bowl. So make sure you're following us. And as always, thanks for watching the Pond Lee Hockey Post Game Show. Go Birds!
So make sure you guys get involved and try to get to the next Eagles home game coming up against the Tennessee Titans. Talking about uh, that game, of course, with Derrick Henry and what they bring to the table next week against the run, this is a dual-threat offense. All times you talk about Aaron Rodgers, all times you talk about guys like Aaron Jones and what they bring to the table, you're talking about a dual-threat offense. Defensively speaking, is this the game that you do be more aggressive, or is this the game that you start to peel off a little bit more to see what the – Green Bay Packers are going to be bringing to the table today, Gunner. Well, if you look at um, – we, we, we criticize the DBs a lot for playing 7 to 10 yards off the ball. But if you look at what they did against Indianapolis, they played a lot of guys closer to the line of scrimmage because they had no fear against those wide receivers. Now, we've talked about how Green Bay has a bunch of young receivers that are trying to find their way. Romeo Dobbs not playing in this game tonight. As Seth talked about, Christian Watson, 6'5", runs a 4'3", 40. He's finally starting to get it. I don't know if the Eagles want to play him bump and run, you know, because he'll get by you in a hurry. He's starting to figure things out. And as we've seen, Rodgers has gotten the ball to him quite frequently in the last couple of weeks. I think he's starting to emerge as Rodgers' go-to guy. You still have old man Randall Cobb still running across the field. You have another 6'5 guy on the other side we don't even talk about on Alan Lazard who can go up and get it as well. So... It's going to be interesting to see. If I was putting my money on this game, I would say Jonathan Gannon is going to have his DBs playing off the wide receivers instead of press coverage. Go ahead, Seth. It's going to be a long night if you play that way because what is Aaron Rodgers truly all about? He's all about pre-snap read. And what you give him pre-snap read, if you show him something, right. if you show him that he can take five yards on first down on the pre-snap read, you know, and, and, and we talked about it on my show this week. I had Rob Domofsky on this week, and we talked about it. How do you know? how much of the runs are really called off in the RPO by Aaron seeing something pre-snap and pulling the ball. I mean, maybe that 122 yards per game could be 150 yards per game if Aaron would just hand the ball off more. But that's what you run into, you know, with the whole RPO system is that the quarterback, you know, they call it, you know, he, he, he has the ability to run what he wants to run. Um, so I just think that it's important for the Eagles secondary to move around, get up, and get back. And now, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is something, you know, that they do all the time. This is a suggestion. Get up and get back. Move in, move out. Move up and bump and bail from, you know, to, to quarters. But you cannot line up like statues against that guy who can, who can determine coverage pre-snap and he will make the right read or he will take what you give him and put them in short, second and short, third and short situations, situations that you can't win in. So you got to do some things different. And I'm not saying I'm not saying 100% you don't come after Aaron Rodgers. There's points in times, there's situations where you're going to have to come. H have you mastered the ability to be able to disguise it long enough you know, you, you got to hold, hold, hold. Ten seconds on the play clock. Now you can move into what you want to move into because now it's too late for him to check, and he's either got to run it or he's got to he's got to call a timeout. That's how you remedy that. Mm -hmm. Are you confident that's the type of scheme Jonathan Gannon's no. going to come up with? <laughs> Absolutely that, not. That, it sounded really yeah, good. Yeah, you're but selling me I on couldn't it. wait for you to stop <laughs> to ask you that question. Hey, Are I, you confident Gannon is going to come up with that? Listen, kind of I wasn't confident that he would do what he did last week. He right, showed us right. some blitzes last week. Yeah. He showed us some run blitzes, some some five six man blitzes in the, in the fourth quarter last week when right. we really needed it. So I'm not going. I'm not going to say that it's not in there. He's just got to move out of that fear factor of giving up the big play and realize that, you know what, if it, you, nothing gained, you, if you don't risk anything, you can't really gain anything. Right. And if you play passive in this Bember don't break style off the defense too long against a guy like this, he will make you pay for it. Because if they stay close long enough, they can be in a position at the end of the game to win the game. And you don't want to do that. This is a team that you know that you're superior to talent-wise in every position except for the quarterback position. You know that, okay? So don't make that one thing. Don't, get, don't make that one advantage for them the game changer. Don't do it. All right, Seth, you're right. It's, it, it's in the book. Gannon has it in his book. It's on the last page written in scribble on a post-it <laughs> note, but it's in the book. Uh, before we move on, we it's have a couple minutes. It's on the folded part. It's on the folded part. Like, oh, wait, that's there. Uh, before we move on, we have a couple more minutes in our opening segment, and I want to make sure we mention in our opening segment a historic night tonight 
for Jason Kelsey. Tonight will be his 170th game as a member wow. of the Philadelphia Eagles on the offensive line, passing a guy named Chuck Bednarik at 169 games played on the Eagles offensive line. Gunner, you have covered Jason Kelsey for his entire career here in Philadelphia. How much do you think a monument like that, a milestone like that, means to Jason Kelsey? It won't mean much to him tonight because he has a focus on a football game. When the season is all said and done, he'll sit back and reflect on that. And maybe even later in the week he will because he'll be asked about it again. But if you want to know one thing about Jason Kelsey, he doesn't put a lot of stock in individual accolades until the season is all said and done. He's always been that low-key guy and, and so smart at putting things in his proper perspective. Now, I'm sure in the back of my mind he's thinking, wow, you know, I'm, I'm passing a guy, uh, you know, uh, concrete Charlie, you know, <laughs> but I got a job to do. I, mean, I got a guy named Kenny Clark who's going to be lining up over me tonight, and he's one of the best D tackles in the game today. That's where my focus is. You know, Jason Kelsey is so cerebral about how he handles a lot of things. It, it's not important to him right now, but it will be down the road. Excellent. All right, now let's go to Lincoln Financial Field where a guy is standing by who has covered more than 170 games, and maybe we will wait to talk to our friend John McMullen. Uh, coming up in just a moment. We'll talk to John McMullen when we come back here on the Jacob Media pregame show. 